So we're going to be um, kind of just hitting a few verses um, this evening. So we stopped short of finishing the chapter two um, because I really want to spend some time pulling apart some of these ideas. You know, we talked about before um, Genesis is that first book of the Bible. And within the first book of the Bible, you've got this this idea um, or called first mention. So the first time things are mentioned, it brings significance for the rest of of the time that we see these things through scripture. So you're going to see first mention really of man and wife here. You're going to see this first direction. Um, And so we're going to spend a little bit of time pulling that apart. And then we also get the introduction to Satan and sin. So, um, you know, you've got the first relationship and then you've got Satan and sin coming in right away, right? If you uh, are in any relationships, you know that that's often kind of how it works. Um, you, sometimes when I'm doing premarital counseling, we talk about, you know, um, sometimes before you're married, you think, oh man, when we get married, it's just going to be perfect. And, you know, sometimes we talk about like two sinners doesn't make less sin. <laughs> so you together doubling up. Um, <clears throat> so like, we're just going to hop in kind of where we left off a little bit in Genesis chapter two. I'm going to go back to verse 22. Genesis 2, verse 22, right at the beginning of the Bible. If you're not sure where to go, just go to like page 1 and flip over maybe a couple, and you'll find your way. So verse 22 says this, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we talked about this a little bit last week, this idea that Adam has his partner, has his helpmate, um, in in the sense that she completes him. Now, actually, Deborah and I were having a conversation later. She's like, I really don't like that idea of, like, being completed by Eve because it kind of gives this, like, I'm not, if I'm single, I'm not complete. The completeness is the human race. For the human race to continue, you've got to have a man and a woman. So completing the package of the beginning of the human race, it's not that you're not complete if you don't have a spouse. That's not the direction um, that we're getting here or hearing. It's, It's that he needed someone to help him fulfill the purpose and calling of God to flourish, right? To multiply. Um, And so he brings, God brings Eve. Um, And Adam, you find here, he is uh, one stoked guy. He's like, whoa, man, woman, this is the one that fits. Like after naming all the animals, like this, this one is for me. And um, I think that's just a sweet thing. I said before, like some people think this was the first song. It's definitely the first thing that we find a man says um, is about a woman. And so then, though, Moses adds, as the author of Genesis, Moses adds this key statement. And the statement is for the future. But he says it right at the beginning. And we're going to spend a a fair amount of time in this verse, verse 24. It says, therefore, so because she was taken out of man, because of your unity and your design, um, your humanity, your sharing of flesh and bone... Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So there's three aspects here that I want to just kind of talk about a little bit. The first is the idea that he shall leave his father and mother. The second, that he holds fast to his wife. And the third, that they will become one flesh. So first, um, he's leaving his parents. Now, obviously, Adam and Eve, they don't have parents, right? Like, God created them. But in the future, and Adam and Eve would be parents, and they would have children, many children, no doubt, and then there would be many in the future. So this is a, a future statement. God is setting up some design and direction here. And so the, the prior most important relationship is now being put behind them. And now he is saying, listen, now the husband and wife is the priority. You've, you're leaving your father and your mother. Um, and that's a part of the design of marriage is that, you know, you, you have a child, that child grows up and becomes an adult and meets another adult and they get married and they create their own family. 
So the interesting word here is leave in the Hebrew azab or azab, um, A-Z-A-B, it means to loosen. So when it says leave, um, the, the like a reference or like original meaning there is to like loosen or set something free. You would use it as like, like loosen an ox um, or set free a servant. So it's not that like I have to just, you know, I have to physically even leave my parents because um, in, in those times, a lot of times, right, they just kind of added on to the tent. <laughs> so you may not leave physically your parents, but the idea is, is that you are set free from your parents, that you are becoming a new unit unto yourself. You have a new mission. You are no longer under submission to your parents. And that's an important thing. You're not, you know, you're not just bringing a friend along to join in your family. You're creating a new family, and so you leave. You are set free from mom and dad, and you become your own family. You become your own unit. And that's a really, I think, important idea to understand. Because if you don't leave, you won't cleave. You'll continue to come back and things just get more complicated. So the first is to leave. You have to be set free from that prior relationship. It doesn't mean that you don't honor them, right? Honor your parents, honor your father and mother. That's a biblical, scriptural idea. But you are not under their submission or mission anymore. You have to have your own family unit. The husband and wife create something new. And the husband leads that process. The husband leads the process of leaving, and then we'll talk about in a second, cleaving. If you really want to stir up some problems, tell your wife how your mom would do it, (laughs) right? Well, you know, this is how my mom, that doesn't go well, right? It doesn't work because why? Because it's a new unit. Ladies, same thing. If you really want to mess up your marriage, go tell your mom and dad all the problems of your husband, like, again, you're, you're creating difficulty because you're, not, you're meant to leave. You're meant to be free and loose. And that becomes a difficulty, right, for parents, right, to allow that to happen, to encourage that to happen. It should be led by the new family, but it should also be encouraged by the parents. We've got to loose them. We've got to set them free. This is not how I would do it. <laughs> right? Just don't, don't say anything. If they ask for some advice, gentle, kind advice maybe, but they have to find their own way. They have to find their own family traditions. They have to find their own family rhythms. They have to find their own way. And a lot of times, they're, and we incorporate what we know, but we're new. We have to leave the old um, to create the new. Then the second part is just as important. You can't just leave the old family. You have to cleave. You have to cleave to that. And that word cleave, it means to cling, to stick to, to stay close, pursue. Right? So to cleave, it, you, know, you know, you know those little dryer sheets? You know they just stick on everything? You pull your clothes out of the dryer and it's like all stuck in there. You've... You're like putting on your pants. You find a dryer sheet down this, down the leg or whatever. Anybody else? Feel, this is just me, right? Let's get real. That's the, I like. I'm just clinging. I'm clinging to my wife, and it's the the responsibility falls on the husband as the head to do that, to hold fast. Now, it's interesting because a lot of times we think naturally hesitate to say this but the naturally the often the woman is a, a little bit more emotional or a little bit more clingy or t- gra- like wants to hold on right like and and so what the, the i think the direction here for the men is like no that's your part to hold on that's your part to cling that's your part to create closeness like She may naturally want that, and that's what's going to be the benefit, is that's what she wants, that's what you need, that's how you lead. And so you lead in closeness. You lead in not just leaving, but cleaving together. If she doesn't feel secure, she is going to 
go back to mom or dad right she'll go back to the other relationships and and vice versa if he doesn't feel secure he may go back to that's why you you leave but you have to cleave because they're going to hold on to something that we want to hold on to something and so the cleaving so choosing choosing things that you do to stay closer is a real part of marriage a healthy marriage i'm choosing the things i'm not just getting a tax break right i'm not just like cohabitating i'm actually choosing the things that are going to bring us closer i'm pursuing i'm sticking to right you make those decisions of like all right like this isn't my favorite thing but we're going to do it so we can do it together and you enjoy that time together um the the temptation honestly i think a lot of times is just to to isolate <clears throat> And we, we need our own time you, that we get that. That's part of the process of life and, you know, whatever. Some of us need more alone time than others. You should have your own time with the Lord. But creating things that bring you close, doing things together, talking together, being on the same page, that's an important thing because alone is easier, but it's not better. It's easier not to deal with difficulties of the other person it's easier not to deal deal with the will of someone else i don't have to worry about someone else like i you know there paul talks about like there's a freedom in singleness i don't have to worry about another person i just worry about like what i feel like god's calling me to do and that's it but when you marry you you worry about another you're caring about another person and that cleaving is part of the call from the very beginning there's a closeness and I think that, just to talk briefly, it, I think that goes into other relationships, right? It's easy to isolate. It's easier to be alone. It's easier not to have to deal with the difficulties of the child or the parent or the spouse or the church. Um, but that's not the purpose and plan of God. We're created from relationships. That very beginning, like we talked about before, like it's not good that man's alone. It's the aloneness that is not good. Um, and so being together, though, costs something. It has a, a, a price in effort and self-denial. But that's where also the growth happens. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can, I can undeniably look back and say like when i got married i really started to grow up when i got when i had kids i really grew up more <laughs> right maturity happens in relationships um i'm part of a body i'm part of a church i'm accountable to other people like it it helps us to grow up it helps us to to develop and that's i think that's part of the goal so there's effort and choice intentionality maybe we could say in leaving and cleaving as God has called us to be. So, um, you know, just thinking through the, the reality that it, relationships involve other people and challenges. Like having a friend is great, but it's not going to remedy all your issues. It's going to create issues, but it's also going to bring blessings. Like um, having a, a spouse is joyous, but it's, it's not going to solve all your personal problems. <laughs> it, it's going to create other problems, right? You just, you, you just work through that. And I think it's so important for us to have that real and biblical understanding of relationships because so many things are romanticized so much nowadays that you know it's it's the it's the bachelor and it's you know before it was the dating game and you know like all of these like it's all roses and you know sunshine all the time like no it's sometimes it's it's arguments and dying to self um but it it brings good fruit and we have to be willing to work in the garden of our relationships if we want to see the good fruit that comes from it. So not putting more weight on a relationship with, pers with a person, but understanding the importance of people and the most weight on a relationship with God. Because all of these, you know, Adam and Eve at this point is just Adam and Eve. This is a good relationship but this is the best relationship. The relationship with God is the only relationship worthy of worship. 
worthy of worship where we like this is the relationship that goes above every other relationship and so that the relationship with adam and eve is good but the relationship with adam and god and eve and god is best and first so even you know even in that dynamic and we'll see in a second like the difficulty sometimes be, becomes putting a relationship with a person above a relationship with God. And that's how things get out of whack quickly. And we'll see as we get a little bit further tonight that that really is the problem is that they were not listening to what God had said. They're listening to what each other are saying or what Satan ends up saying. So God is the worship, is the, is the relationship to worship. The other is the relationship to enjoy. So first you have um, the, the leaving, then you have the cleaving. And then it says, they shall become one flesh. So then you have this idea of unity. All right, so the unity is the goal. Why do I leave? Why do I cleave? So there's oneness. And I think that's true for just about every real relationship that you want to have. You want to have unity. You want to have oneness. You don't have the same oneness with every relationship. There are different relationships, right, where friendships are different than marital relationships that are different than, you know, um, child relationships with a parent. All of those relationships are a little bit different, but you want to have unity. The Bible talks about, like, how can you walk together unless you agree? That's why it's so important to be walking in relationship with people that do agree. That oneness doesn't mean you're the same, but it does mean that you are in agreement and that you're, that you're in community with each other, right? Co-unity, community. So seeking the Lord, I have found, and I think scripture will tell you is the best way to have a good relationship with another person. So... It's not me coming to Deborah with an issue. It's me coming to the Lord and then to Deborah. And Deborah seeking the Lord and me seeking the Lord, right? You and your spouse may have a difficulty. The question is, what does God say about this? And then coming to seek the Lord together. And that takes so much of the friction out of the, out of the process. Where do I unify? And that way, I unify on the truth of God's word. There may be something that we're discussing or arguing or we have friction about that's not in God's word, and then we have to process through that, right? Then we have to listen. Then we have to understand. Well, with your wife, with the understanding. Then I have to submit. Maybe I submit under my husband. Maybe my husband at this point, for whatever the decision is, you know, there is submission one to another, that's a biblical idea, though this, the headship ultimately is the husband's. And that's one of the hardest pieces, right? When, when, when your wife is like, well, you decide before the Lord what's right. And then you're like, oh no, it's a pressure. Like, I'd rather just fight about it. <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd rather just like, let's just argue some more until somebody's right. It's like, oh no, why don't you just ask the Lord? Okay, then now... But that's a, that's a biblical model, right? That's the purpose that God has set up as, as there's a leader in every team. Um, doesn't mean that somebody's less important or, or more important, just a different role. So the thing I want you to notice is this idea of, um, of a unity, maybe not even unity yet, but just this idea that this is descriptive and not prescriptive. Just because Adam is given Eve while he's sleeping doesn't mean that you shouldn't date or, you know, be involved in other relationships outside of that. I don't think, like, there are things that are descriptive. They just describe how it was. And then there's things that are prescriptive. Um, this is how you should do it. This isn't necessarily prescriptive in the, you know, I was just asleep and I, all of a sudden my wife just appeared you may need to go on a few dates, right? You may need to date a few duds. I don't know. You work through your process. Um, but ultimately, a wife is a gift from the Lord, right? A marriage is a gift from the Lord. And as you're seeking God and trusting God and relating, you honestly learn a lot, 
right? We learn a lot in the relationships that we go through. So that last part of the leaving and the cleaving, the one flesh um, being the goal, the goal is unity. And that's really what, that's from like the prayer of Christ, you know, in John to, to hear with one flesh, like that unity is what God desires. And that unity is difficult. It's a challenge. It becomes even more of a challenge if you decide to get in relationships with people that have a different worldview than you have, that have different a purpose in life, a different goal. That's why I think one of the, that's, you know, not unequally yoked, talking about those relationships, that you can have unification. We can meet together um, in scripture we can meet together by faith we can meet together in truth um not like well i don't believe that and you believe that 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 creates a lot of stress and a lot of difficulty um the other thing obviously you know there's a unity sexually like man and woman were created to physically fit right they go together to create new men and women babies right i mean that's part of the process and that's why sex is for marriage that's why it's created for that not just the creation of babies but the creation of unity of oneness of one fleshness so that you are united right and and the problem in our culture a lot of times is you know people are having sex together they're uniting and then they're ripping apart and then somebody else and then they have uniting in sexual relationship and then they're just being ripped apart and and you lose the closeness, you lose the specialness, the uniqueness of true fellowship, right? And that's the, that's the point that Paul is talking, or that, uh, that Moses, rather, is talking about here is this one flesh idea, one flesh sexually, one flesh emotionally, one flesh socially, one flesh spiritually. Then in all these different dynamics, like, when you think about the relationships that you're involved in, like, can you have unity emotionally? Can you have unity socially? Can you have unity spiritually? Right? Those, those dynamics all play into it. The other idea that's interesting, like I told you about this law of first mention, twice in the New Testament, this, this scripture is referred to. Both Jesus and Paul refer back, as being asked questions about marriage, they go all the way back to this, Genesis chapter 2. When people are questioning Jesus about divorce, right? Is it okay to be divorced? What is, he goes all the way back to this scripture. Um, he's like, listen, the design from the beginning, unity, one flesh. A man shall leave and cleave. When Paul speaks of the need for sexual purity, he actually goes back to this verse, right? He is talking about what, what's the point? Well, what's the purpose? The purpose is leave, cleave, become one flesh. Sexual impurity, not part of the plan, not part of the process. Why? Because it's not healthy. It's not helpful. It's not that God is like, you know, the giant killjoy in the sky of like, I don't want you to ever have any pleasure. I don't want you, I mean, God created pleasure. God created sex it's pleasurable. That wasn't like a, you, you know, like you, you make something, you're like, oh, like side note, this actually happened. <laughs> it wasn't like God was like, oh, side note, this is fun. <laughs> no, like it's part of the deal. It's part of the process. It's part of the purpose. But this sexual immorality, having sex with all these different people that they were doing in Corinth or whatever, it's like that is not creating oneness. That's not creating the multiplication in the earth in a, in a healthy family unit, right? It's creating more problems. So it feels good in, a, in the moment. It's not good for the future. So choosing relationships, I think, carefully, right? Cultivating relationships diligently and then continuing relationships faithfully, I think those are, the, those are part of the pieces that we're being encouraged in our lives. Whether that's marriage, I think you can apply it to like friendships, to family relationships, to church relationships, choosing carefully, cultivating diligently, continuing faithfully. Those are, those are keys to finding good fruit, finding good fruit in your relationships. So then Moses also adds this, after this leave and cleave, one flesh, and he says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. 
Now, this is kind of a funny thing. Both of these are interesting. One of the small group questions, you know, some of you guys have small groups after Wednesday nights. Um, one of the small group questions is like, why, why do you think Moses added this in here? Why did, you know, why does he tell us this? This is kind of an interesting, like, thing. Just so you know, if you didn't figure this out, the man and the woman, they were both naked. It's like, okay. And they didn't have any problem with it. They weren't ashamed. This pre-sin condition, and they're by themselves, right? Like, it appears that this is, there's all there is right now, Adam and Eve, no Cain or Abel yet. So here's, I think, the interesting thing, because of how it fits with the, you know, the leave, the cleave, the one flesh. Nakedness is not a bad thing. It's a covenant thing. It's meant to be in a covenant. Just like this sex part is meant to be in a covenant. This covenant relationship, this agreed upon trust between two people. That's the point. That's, that's the direction that we're giving. And so the, the trust leads into the willingness to be vulnerable right? I can be vulnerable. We can be intimate. It's a, you know, it, unfortunately in our culture, it's a quick hookup and there's no real connection. There's no real intimacy. And so there, people continue to search for and look for and try to get, and yet you're missing the point. The point is real relationship comes with trust and covenant. And that's why nakedness or sex is reserved for marriage because that's a covenant between a man and a woman so then ironically right after marriage right after this verse one of chapter three we're just going to hit a few verses Um, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the lord god had made interesting here about the serpent. In other places in scripture, we're told this is Satan. Funny enough, this, just yesterday, I went for a run in Aliso Woods, and as I'm running down the trail, there's this big fat snake right in front of me. Um, like, trails like this big, snakes like this big. There's no way to get around it. And I was like, at first, I've seen a lot of different snakes in Aliso, right? If you've lived here long enough, you see some snakes. And at first, I thought it was a gopher. And then I looked at it, I'm like, nope, that's got a good size rattle at the end. That's a rattlesnake. And he appeared to have eaten something. He was a little bit fat and just wouldn't get out of the way. He may have been shedding because later I could, like, he wasn't, he wasn't tracking. I started throwing things at him, right? Like, he was not a cunning snake. I was thinking, I'm like talking about Satan and thinking about this, uh, this passage and just like, this is the dumbest snake I've ever seen. I'm throwing him. I hit him with a rock and that really ticked him off. He gets up, he rattles like, like ready, but I could see he can't see me because after a while, I'm like, I, I got to get, like, he won't move. I got, I got to go around, which just freaked me out to get in the grass because I just figured like maybe his brother's around or something. <laughs> But he wouldn't, as I'm moving, he's, not, he's just not watching. He's still looking where, where the rock came from. That's an uncommon snake. <laughs> Here, Satan um, it says that he is more crafty, more cunning. He has more tricks up his sleeve. He pays attention. We find him in, you know, coming up in Job, like, what have you been doing? I've, just been, I've been walking around looking, just watching people. Figuring out where I can find a weak spot. Figuring out how I can get in. Interesting that he also, Satan comes up a couple times um, in prophets. So some of the things that we know about Satan really come from some prophets. So if you want to look at this later, you can. Ezekiel 28, we won't spend too much time here. But Ezekiel, he begins talking about wicked kings and then all of a sudden, this, this prophecy becomes like something that's clearly different. And he, been, he begins talking about Satan being in Eden and how he was beautiful and, and perfect until iniquity was found. His heart was lifted up with pride because of his beauty, he did his desire to be worshipped. Um, kind of an interesting insight, right? He didn't want to worship. He wanted to be worshipped. He didn't want to praise God. He wanted to be praised. And we find also there's this, there, that he's violent, right? Satan is malicious. And if you 
if you live in this world and you read the news and you look around and you don't believe that there's really an evil, there's Satan, Satan as the God of this world, this is a messed up world. And the things that happen in this world are a direct correlation to the wicked, violent, malicious, demonic purpose of Satan. So he comes up in Ezekiel 28, and then he comes up in Isaiah 14. Again, talking about another king. This was the king of Babylon. Earlier, he's talking about the king of Tyre, and he just like slides into this weird description. I think this is interesting. I'll read you a few verses. Isaiah 14, he's talking about the king of Babylon, and then he, he begins to say this, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit." So notice how many times, over and over, I will, I will, I will, right? That is the, that's the mark of the devil. And that's the danger for us, right? Because up until this point, Adam and Eve, it's, it's God says what's good. God creates, God directs, God brings the wife, God calls them to leave and cleave and eat all of one flesh, and then not. But Satan, Satan is I will, I will, I will, I will. And whenever we get too far into the I wills, you've got to be careful because you're, it may sound good. Satan was beautiful. He comes deceptively. If he had come all scary and freaky, like, like, it, like I'm not listening to that, <laughs> right? Eve probably would have run away, but here, that's not what happens. So we have, our, you know, we have Adam, we have Eve and God, and that's great. That's very good. But now we have Satan. Satan enters the scene, this, this serpent of old. This is, in a sense, another relationship. Right? When we talk about relationships, this is another relationship. This is something that has come to talk with Eve. Something that has come to insert himself into the relationship between Adam and Eve and the relationship between God and mankind. And he kind of inserts. Not every relationship is a blessing. Not every relationship brings goodness. There are some selfish, malicious, hurtful relationships that should not be encouraged or forwarded, right? Like, they need to stop. But this, this is a relationship that Eve should have, could have stopped. Like, I'm just done. I'm not listening to you. <laughs> I'm not going along with this. But she begins this conversation. So we'll look at verse 4. It says, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, you... God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the first thing I want you to notice that Satan is saying here is that you're going to be like God. Now, in the beginning, you would say this does not sound like a bad thing, right? Like, like the temptation that Satan puts forth isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. It sounds like a good thing, this, um, this tempter. He doesn't tempt with evil, per se. He tempts with something that looks good but is outside of the will of God, right? If you, if you go back, I missed the first couple verses there. It says, um, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals of the Lord. This is the NIV version God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So he begins to throw doubt, right? Did God really say? You, you, you're not gonna die. And he throws doubt on God's word. He begins to build a case against God with just a question. It's interesting because 
you know, like, well, are you going to really? Uh, and doubt begins to get formed. He makes that statement, really, that causes her to question. He denies what God has said. And then look what, look what uh, Eve does. So when the woman saw, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, good and knowing good and evil, like God, she took of its fruit and ate. Those are the three things often that lead us into sin, right? It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's the, it looks good, it feels good, it seems good, it's probably going to be good for me. That's the weird thing about sin, Sin brings death, but it usually starts off looking good. There's some appeal. I, you know, when I'm talking with high schoolers or honestly anybody, right, like it's not a temptation if there isn't some goodness involved. To say that sin, you know, to tell our kids, listen, sin is bad. It doesn't feel good. It's, it's horrible. It's all this. And then whatever it is, they're like, actually, that was super fun. (laughs) Like, actually, that really felt good. Sin, there always is some pleasure to sin in the beginning. That first hit, that first experience, that first just outburst of anger, you just let it go and it feels so good. Whatever it is, like sin starts off feeling good, seeming good, looking good, but it brings death because it's not good according to God. Remember, we, from the very beginning, God declares what is good. She has decided what's good based on what she saw, based on what she thought. And that is where the problem begins, is when we take the role of God. Instead of hearing from God, we say, well, I will. I will decide what's good. I think this is good. I think this is right. I think this is helpful. And Satan's like, you just go right ahead. Right, you go right ahead because I will is in opposition to his will. My will has to be submitted to his will. And that becomes her problem. And then I think one of the saddest, and we're going to close actually with this. And she, it says, she, so she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Seriously? The whole world changed, and that's all they say about it. She had some, and she gave it to her husband, who was with her. Where is Adam? This whole conversation. Can you just imagine a different ending? (laughs) Right? Like, Satan's talking to your wife. Your wife is being tempted. And the, oh, this fruit looks good. I think it's going to make us wise. I don't know. And Adam is just standing there like an idiot right like speak up say something he's just i don't know comfortable on the couch of i don't know where what he's doing but if he would have stepped up i think everything would have been different because the man is who god holds responsible right the the man as the head who he had already you know created and given a wife and all of this stuff like the man is responsible and he takes no responsibility and the whole thing goes down the tube and so the man has to take responsibility in the home the man has to take responsibility for the truth the man has to take responsibility for decisions that are going to change the direction of your family And here, this decision that's being made is going to change the direction of the human race. Because that looks good to me. But it wasn't what God said was good. So, a simple sentence signals the end of the world as they know it. And from then on, right, we're having to deal with sin. So we'll go a little bit deeper. There's more to it. There's more that we will discover in chapter 3. Um, but I think there's a lot of good, in, good, good things here to kind of meditate on, get some insight, um, have some conversations. Um, because let's not forget that what God says is good is good. What we think is good 
That's just our opinion. And if it doesn't align up with God, we're wrong. And he's got a reason. And that's why still, like we're talking about in Galatians, still the just shall live by faith. We've got to trust that what God says is good is good. And we're going to find life and fulfillment and joy and, and purpose in that and not in what we think is good. And it starts with relationships, right? Our relationship with God and then our relationship with each other. And in this, with Adam and Eve. So let's pray and we'll close. Father, we are grateful that you um, don't leave us in the dark about relationships. God, some of the, the most enjoyable things that we experience in life are because of relationships. Family and marriage and friendship and ministry and church life and um, God, there's just so many things, and they're all really just attached to relationships. And you've given us some clear direction and some clear guidance. And Lord, we also see what, what happens when we go outside of what you say is good. And we pray, Lord, that you keep us close. We pray that you'd re we would remember your word, um, that we would remember and know your direction, that we would seek it. And when we have disagreements, when we have difficulties between each other in relationships, that we'd seek you first, Lord that you would be exalted in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.